What's up, you guys? Dr. Gunnan back with a third in a series of four sports psychology videos. In this video, we'll be talking about psychological techniques for improved sport performance. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology at Point Loma Nazarene University. And in this video, we'll be talking about techniques to get your athletes to those optimal levels of arousal to achieve peak sport performance. Now, this information comes from the textbook, Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. This chapter, chapter eight, was written by Drs. Statler and Dubois. So let's dive right in. Now, the first set of techniques we will cover are relaxation techniques, and these are techniques to control elevated levels of arousal and anxiety. Remember that if we're thinking of the inverted U hypothesis, as arousal increases, so does performance up to a certain point. But once you get into this zone, past that zone, we see that performance will start to decrease. So if we find ourselves maybe over here on the graph, how do we get back? How do we decrease arousal levels? And that's what we'll be talking about. Now, the first is diaphragmatic breathing. This is the focus of thought on breathing uh, to the exclusion of other thoughts and letting any distractions or negative thoughts, any doubts sort of pass into the mind and then pass right out as you continue to focus on breathing. And it can help clear the mind and therefore increases concentration. The second, besides breathing techniques, although breathing techniques are really great, like that could be the bread and butter of your team's psychological preparedness, or at least the starting point and entry level into some of these techniques. The next is progressive muscle relaxation, or PMR for short. And this is where you achieve relaxation by going through a series of alternate muscular tensing and relaxing phases, and the athlete learns to become aware of somatic tension in the body and therefore to control it. So, uh, you know, you might have seen this before, you might have done this where you're lying down and you have somebody guiding the group of athletes or the athlete through this, where you start at maybe your head and you work towards the toes and you uh, alternately contract and then relax muscles. And by doing so, by moving your attention of focus onto those body parts, you can start to sense somatic tension and then release it. The next would be autogenic training. Now, autogenic training uh, is similar to the PMR technique, but in this one, you don't actually contract and then relax your muscle. You focus your thought and attention on it and you feel the sensations of that body part. You direct your focus to any sensations arriving from that body part and you try to feel the warmth and the heaviness of a limb and if there's any tension, you just feel it relax. You feel it let go because as the tension uh, comes into your awareness, now you can control it and release the tension. The next one is a little bit different. This is called systematic desensitization, and it combines both mental and physical techniques that allow the athlete to replace a fear response with a relaxation response. So I'm sure you've all seen those athletes that are like deer in the headlights at a big competition. I've been there myself as a young athlete. And what we want to do is we sort of want to inoculate the athlete to these big competition, these high stress, types of environments. You can do that in a lot of different ways. One, one easy and simple way is by having lower key competitions leading up to the big competition. And, and most people have this naturally as part of the cycle of competition or part of the competition period. So having low key uh, matches or tournaments or events leading up to the real deal, the big, you know, the, the whatever it is, the championships, the conference champs, whatever. Uh, this helps athletes find ways to deal with their increased anxiety levels before the big dance, so to speak. Now, another way to do it is to do something like a competition modeling in practice. So whether that's a scrimmage or whether that's a home you know, game against uh, somebody else outside the league, or maybe it's a time trial, or maybe it's race modeling, if it's like an endurance runner or something where you model the race, you model what happens when you get past or when you're running under fatigue. Um, but then we also have some visualization techniques that we'll see later, um, these more mental techniques where we visualize these high stress environments, these big meets or matches or games, and we, we visualize what we will do in, the, in those situations. So how should an athlete use arousal control techniques? Well, we should employ arousal reduction techniques when performing a new skill or one that is complex, or typically if we have too much arousal in a high stress environment. 
This allows us to achieve, to scale it back, to achieve a more optimal level for that skill. And we should employ arousal enhancement techniques when executing simple skills or ones that are well learned. So I always remember the example of talking to one of my buddies who is a pusher for the USA bobsled, bobsled team, um, uh, one of the world teams a few years ago. And he was a pusher, he wasn't the pilot, right? He wasn't the, the driver. So the driver had to keep his arousal level, you know, kind of down, uh, capped to a certain level because he had to be able be able to focus and steer this bobsled at 80 miles an hour down this icy chute, right? And that, I mean, that's pretty crazy. But the pusher, which my friend was, he had to get just amped up because his job was to accelerate as fast as possible while pushing a massive sled. And that's, once you have acceleration technique down, you know how to do it on the ice and you can do it in sync with your other bobsled partners, mates, whatever you call them, uh, you can get really, really, psyched up for that and then that will just lead to better performance because you have this explosive movement that you're just bam charging down the track but the driver couldn't let himself get so amped up so that he would miss the first few turns he had to keep it calm and cool execute his push and then hop in and drive that thing down the course so the whole purpose of employing arousal reduction or enhancement techniques is to allow the athlete to perform with an unburdened mind while matching his or her mental and physical intensities to the demands of the task. Now, one technique is called imagery or visualization. This is a cognitive psychological skill in which the athlete uses all of his or her senses to create a mental experience of an athletic performance. So you might coach an athlete through this or guide them through this by telling them to close their eyes, to sit down in a quiet area, and then you, you lead them through by saying, you know, imagine the sound of the crowd, imagine the smell of the, of the turf or the field, or of you, I don't know, of your own sweat, <laughs> of the fear of the other team. Imagine the feeling of what it's like to be, to be primed and ready and to feel springy and to feel ready to go. And then talk them through how the game will go. You know, the first, you know, the first touch or the kickoff or the, the gun goes off and the race starts. And then we walk them through. And the athlete is imagining themselves performing optimally in each of these situations. This allows athletes to get used to uncertain environments over longer periods of time, despite not being there in person or despite minimal real world competitive opportunity. Now, some of these techniques such as imagery or visualization uh, can increase self-confidence and self-efficacy, but there's a lot more to these two, uh, two things. Self-confidence is the belief that one can successfully perform a desired behavior. So confidence is just like your belief in yourself. I can do it. I can perform this. Now, it doesn't mean it's necessarily backed up by performance. You can be very confident and you can be overconfident. We also have self-efficacy. Now, self Efficacy is a situation-specific form of self-confidence. Self-confidence is kind of general. We've all met that like young 19-year-old kid who's overly confident. He just has general confidence about everything. Self-efficacy is a specific form of confidence within a certain domain. This is the perception of one's ability to perform a given task in a specific situation. So maybe contrasted to this overconfident 19-year-old kid, maybe we have kind of a shy and underconfident kid who, you know, perhaps they're awkward in social situations or they, you know, kind of have this demeanor of a lack of confidence, but put them in the right situation, the one that they feel high self-efficacy for, you know, who knows what it is. Uh, we're talking about athletes, so maybe it's their chosen sport. They feel really confident in that sport. Put them there and suddenly all of that former, you know, doubt and uh, lack of confidence goes away because they have a, a high self-efficacy, a high situationally specific form of self-confidence for this certain event. Hey buddy, good morning. I hear you. I'm sorry. Okay. Cool. And he said that Buster's gonna eat you. He said Buster's gonna eat you? Well, Buster's not gonna eat you. Um, I'm gonna continue this video, buddy, but can you go upstairs and get dressed and I'll be up in a minute? Now, self-efficacy derives from a number of sources, from performance accomplishments, vicarious experiences, so watching somebody else do something or living, living through somebody else uh, performing a task that actually helps you to gain knowledge of the task uh, yourself. Verbal persuasion, so a coach or parent giving you encouragement. Imaginal experience, so this is that visualization technique we talked about earlier. 
physiological states, so achieving the optimal level of arousal can increase your self-efficacy. And then also emotional states, so what is your level of state anxiety at the moment? Now the key point is that self-efficacy influences people's choice of activity, their level of effort in that activity, and how much persistence they will have in the face of challenging obstacles. So we want to try to increase the self-efficacy of our athletes through some of those means on the previous page, through uh, giving them encouragement, by giving them uh, more and more positive competition experiences, by helping them to visualize big key meets or, or games or matches. Now another psychological technique is self-talk. Self-talk is a technique used to enhance self-efficacy, aid in directing proper focus, assist in regulating arousal levels, and to reinforce motivation. So these are the things that we say to ourselves, either out loud or in our heads, and they can be positive, negative, or instructional. Now, we don't want to steer our athletes towards any negative self-talk, you know, saying, ah, like, you know, in your head, repeating over and over, like, I messed up, or man, I suck, or I'm not fast enough, I'm not good enough, or I'm going to choke under pressure. Those types of doubts, of course, we want to try to eradicate from our athletes' heads, or at least teach them to deal with them when they do arise. Positive self-talk could be giving your athletes a mantra to repeat to themselves as they're going through the task. You know, hopefully it doesn't distract them from the task-relevant cues, but simple things like, you know, I remember in races, I would think, like, I'm tough, I'm tough, I'm tough, over and over again, or... Um, I, I like to kick, I like to outkick people at the end. So just thinking uh, over and over again, like, like I have the kick, I have the kick. And I would just have to hang on until the end, until I could outkick the opponent with a burst of speed. And so just giving yourself this very simple or giving your athletes these very simple, uh, positive self-talk uh, phrases can be hugely, hugely beneficial. They could also be instructional, right? So when I teach Olympic lifts, I, uh, especially to somebody who's new, I teach after they find the initial position from the floor, I teach knees back, knees forward, and then pull. Very simple. And I have them repeat that to, this, to themselves as they do a halting clean pull or snatch pull to hit the positions first before they string them together into a fluid movement. So that's an instructional set of self-talk cues. So the key point with all of this, we have our relaxation techniques and our uh, arousal enhancement techniques. Relaxation techniques are designed to reduce the physiological arousal and increase task-relevant focus. These techniques are of extreme importance when one is executing complex or novel tasks or performing in high-pressure situations. Now we need to talk a little bit about goal setting. Goal setting is very important for the process of the athletes to achieve their optimal levels of performance through sports psychology. We have a couple different types of goals. Process goals are goals over whose achievement the athlete has control. So showing up to practice, uh, getting proper nutrition, being hydrated, getting good sleep, being precise with the execution of whatever the lift is for the day. These are all part of the process that the athlete can control. Outcome goals are goals over which the athlete really doesn't have much control. So hitting a new PR, it, you know, the athlete can do everything right in the process, but because of the high individual differences and the variability uh, from day to day, maybe they, maybe they just don't have it that day, they can't hit the PR, but they've done everything right in the process goals. Another example of an outcome goal is winning a match or winning a game. The athlete doesn't have control, they can contribute to a win, they can give their best effort, but sometimes the best efforts an athlete will give uh, could be during a losing match and they end up losing. And so the outcome is not what you wanted, but the process of competing was all there. And then we have short-term versus long-term goals. Short-term goals increase the likelihood of success because they build upon each other and it helps the athlete to sort of snowball this success and, and positive self-efficacy efficacy on the way to that long-term outcome goal. The long-term goal provides relevance to the short-term goals. We're doing these short-term goals in order to achieve this long-term goal. We're gaining muscle mass right now so that we can make that muscle stronger, so that we can use that extra strength to become more powerful, so that we can be the most powerful team come you know, the final competition of the season. Some guidelines for using goal setting. Long-term goals and short-term goals are interdependent. They build upon each other and they're related to each other. Long-term goals provide a sense of meaningfulness for pursuing the short-term goals, right? Uh, th those long-term goals give us our direction, and then the short-term goals are the path in that direction. 
The attainment of short-term goals provides a hierarchical sense of mastery and success. It increases the self-efficacy for these athletes and builds self-confidence. So athletes should define process goals to focus on elements of their performance over which they have control. So throughout that, throughout the short-term and the long-term goals, and in your achievement or your, your desire to achieve those outcome goals, the athletes can really focus on the process goals. What can they do in the process that they have control over that will increase the likelihood of success? Now, in the fourth video of this series, we'll talk about enhancing motor skill acquisition and learning. So we're not done yet until we've talked about that topic. It will appear somewhere on the screen. Click over to find it. If you had any questions about goal setting or about psychological techniques to increase or reduce arousal levels, let me know in the comments below. I'm not a sports psychologist, but I have read this chapter in the book and I've taught it. And I've been an athlete and coached many of them. So I can answer from that standpoint. But either way, I'll see you guys over in the next video. No, it's gonna mess up my camera. Okay, one time. Just do it one time. Cool. Okay, turn it back on. Yeah, go upstairs. I love you.